people have asked me about how do the faithful know what heresy is or how do the faithful know uh, what is schismatic or for that matter how do, the, how do the faithful know what they must believe now St. Thomas who is a great theologian but also he's such a great mind that he explains things so very very simply what do we have to believe explicitly St. Thomas asks what do we have to believe explicitly to save our souls well we have to believe the 12 articles depending on how you divide them up in the Apostles Creed I believe in God if you're going to be save your soul you have to believe that God exists and that, as scripture tells us, that, that God rewards those who seek him. So we, that's the first article of faith we have to believe. We have to believe that Jesus Christ came as true God and true man, and that he died on the cross for us and he rose from the dead on the third day, and that he was born of the Virgin Mary. So if you know the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. So all creation, everything that exists, whether it's the room I'm in, the chair I'm sitting on, or the earth I walk on, or the planet I'm on, or the stars that are around me, or the sun that shines on us, all of that's created by God from nothing. That's what we have to believe. Creator of heaven and earth, and of course of all the stars and everything else. So anything that exists, anything that exists, and all persons, including angels who are persons, all of them only exist because God created them. And if God, by the way, withdrew his will for a moment to, to not keep them in, in existence, they would go back to where they came from, that is, nothing. So we have to believe these things. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, so that who was conceived of the Holy Ghost, so that, that he, was, he existed from all eternity, that is, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, is as St. Saint, Saint, um, Saint John in the, the fourth gospel says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word is St. John's way of calling uh, our Lord the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Uh, to explain why is Jesus called the Word, is if you go back for a moment and you think about, before I pronounce a word to you, that word occurs to my mind. And so that word is generated in my mind. And so it's a spiritual generation. And the, but in the beginning was the Word, the, but the Word that's in God's mind is the second person. God the Father is infinitely good. And so nothing is worthy of his attention not, he's, he takes care of us in providence, but it really doesn't strain him at all, so to speak, to take care of us. But what's worthy of his full attention is himself. And so he reflects upon himself from all eternity. And he reflects upon himself so much that he pours himself into that word, which is the second person of the Blessed Trinity. And so this spiritual generation is going on from all eternity in God that he's meditating on himself and so much that he pours himself into so, he is, and being infinite, he, he doesn't create, because that's the wrong word, but he begets in, in, in intellectually from all eternity the person of the Word. And that, that person of the Word is Jesus, is the second person of the Trinity, and that person is equal to God the Father in every way. He's from all eternity, he's all-powerful, and so when St. John tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh, and that that is Jesus who existed from all eternity, is made flesh, becomes, uh, becomes a child in the womb of the Blessed Virgin and is born on Christmas Day in Bethlehem. And that, that person, now in his sacred humanity, he's not equal to the Father, but as a, the person who is Jesus, he is equal to God the Father. And that person is divine. Anyway, so we, what do we have to believe? We have to believe the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. That is, obviously, he, he suffered the scourging, the crown with thorns, and, and the, carrying the cross, and dying on the cross. All of this took place because Pontius Pilate refused to protect him, even though he knew he was innocent, and allowed them to carry this out as if it was some sort of sentence of a criminal court when he was claimed innocent. But that's what happened, and we must believe that. He suffered on Pontius Pilate, was crucified, was killed on the cross, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, and, he sits, and he, he sits at the right hand of God. Obviously, for 40 days, he's on the earth, then he ascended to heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence, he shall come to judge. He will come at the end of the world to judge the living and the dead. And the rest of the creed is, I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. So whether a person doesn't know, doesn't even know how to read, he has to believe in the Apostles' Creed. He wants to believe each article of the Apostles' Creed. And so if someone who's a PhD, who's gone to university, he's been studying for 15, 20 years or longer, tells him not to believe one of these articles, he doesn't need the Pope. I oh, know the Pope should defend him, of course. He doesn't need anybody else. He says, no, this is against the Apostles' Creed. I'm not going with you. That's it. And there have been saints who couldn't read, couldn't write, but they understood their obligation to believe the Apostles' Creed. And so that's the foundation. Everyone can follow that. Now, as you get, a person goes through high school or college and they learn some things and say, well, what about this? There's always an answer to those whatabouts and you need to find it. You can't deny the faith because some intelligent person has put a question that you can't answer today. And therefore, you, you follow what he says. No, there is an answer to every one of those questions that's ever been raised. How do you know then what is heresy? Well, how do you know? Well, there are, of course, the definitions you can find for $10. I mean, if you can't pay, afford it, we can find them for you. But for $10 or so, you can buy a book of the definitions in English translation. And they give you the reference where they got them from. And they give you the definition that says, this you must believe. And it's even for about $20 in some books, dogmatic books, point out that and against this teacher from history or this teacher recently who's holding this point of view. And, the, and these things are easy enough to get hold of and easy enough to understand. Most of them are easy enough to understand for anyone with a uh, high school uh, diploma, basically. There are some very rarefied uh, terms and whatnot to, that some university people need to know, but most of them you can find out and you can know for yourself. And so th this is how we know. We know what the dogmas are and what is a heresy? Heresy is not accepting one dogma, one defined doctrine of the Catholic Church. If you say, I don't believe that, when it's defined by the church, then you're no longer Catholic. You no longer have the Catholic faith. Now, how is it the person can say, well, I believe, but I don't believe that? Well, the answer is that St. Thomas points out that, again, that the faith is you believe something on the authority of God. Why do we believe the Catholic faith? Because we, it's true. How do we know it's true? Because God told us it's true. Well, how do we go, God can't make a mistake? Well, of course, to say that is a blasphemy. The fact is that God is all holy, and therefore he cannot lie. And God is all-knowing, therefore he cannot be mistaken. So if God tells us something is true, then we are we, certain that it's true. And for us to believe, not believe, and if God has told us a certain dogma is true, then we have to believe the dogma. But you say, well, I, I don't accept this one here. Well, then you're, what you believe, everything else, is sort of, I accept these other things because it's my opinion. But in this one, I don't accept God's authority in this one. And therefore, it really isn't the, act, it isn't the virtue of faith to take that attitude. And so we must not to be saved. We cannot accept one heresy. Now, sometimes people in their ignorance don't know any better. I can say myself, before I studied some theology, uh, and when I was studying the Council of Trent, I realized that I was what would be called a, a Pelagian or a semi-Pelagian, which is to say that we can be good without grace. But when you study the, when you know the reading, and it's easy enough to read just in the Council of Trent, because they chose languages, which is quite simple, direct, and clear, that you cannot be good without grace. And you, to be great, good, you need grace. It is easier, in my way of expressing to you, it's easier for you to live without breathing than for you to be good without grace. If we cannot survive for more than a couple of minutes without taking any oxygen from outside, then we cannot be good for the same distant length of time without grace. That's how necessary grace is for us to be good. And that's something which, uh, but at one point in time, because of my ignorance, because I hadn't studied the subject, and I think that most people, perhaps most Catholics, don't understand the absolute necessity of grace for them to be good. And somehow they sometimes, when they are good, they sometimes say, see how good I am, it's, it's all my work. No, no, you did work at it, you have to cooperate with grace, but it's not enough. You couldn't do it without God giving the grace first. Grace is given gratuitously. And so we should not be uh, giving ourselves any kind of pat on the back to say that, I did this by myself because we didn't. None of us did. Grace is necessary for salvation. So that's why prayer is necessary for your salvation, to get the grace you need to save your soul. We'll talk some more. God bless you, and thanks for being with me.